The old Bailey. This place always makes me feel strange. I seem to get chills down my spine and break out in a nervous sweat at all, the, all at the same time. Well, I didn't think I'd be back here so soon. That's my line! Good morning! Ah, oh, good morning, Mr. Natsume. It was only two days ago that I was declared not guilty here. Yes, we somehow managed to prove he didn't stab Miss Green in the back. But now this, another morning, another murder, and here I am again in this hellhole. Can't keep coming to court. I'm beginning to think he's right. It really does seem as though he's cursed. Mr. Naruhodo, I'm afraid I have bad news. Oh. Mr. Natsume, good morning. Yes, morning. So, here we are again. Yes, again. Judicial Assistant Miss Migotoba Esquiress, what's the bad news? Oh dear, you heard, didn't uh, you heard, did you? If you come in shouting at the top of your voice, people can hear, can, can't help hearing what you say. Oh, I am sorry. You've done nothing wrong, Miss Susato. Now what is it? Well, it seems that the prosecution in today's trial will be led by Lord Bar Barack Van, Van Zeiss. Van Zeiss? Oh no, oh no, no. The so-called Reaper of the Bailey, the most legendary prosecutor in the land. In the trial two days ago, he pursued Soseki and I relentlessly, of course by the skin of our teeth. We managed to pull through, but still. Perhaps Mr. Natsumi's acquittal in the last trial wasn't the end of the matter, after all. Yes, I know what you're thinking, the legend of the Reaper that says nothing can save a person in the dock when Lord Van Zykes is, is the prosecutor. Oh no. That, e that even if a person is found not guilty, the accused will meet a mysterious end one way or another. And we've experienced it firsthand. A man we successfully defended met the most terrifying end after his acquittal, right here in the Old Bailey. Ah, do I have to put up with those ice-cold eyes boring into my soul again? Cursed by evil spirits and now the Reaper. Pair of petrifying perils, potentially. Well, if it's potentially... At least you appear to have hope, Mr. Natsume. Lock'em student, Mr. Naruhodo Esquire. Uh, yes? I'm... I'm innocent. You have to believe me. You, you more than anyone now. Don't worry. I'll be your steadfast ally every step of the way in this battle. I promise. And this promises to be a hard battle, I fear. Well... The trial is scheduled to begin shortly. We should move into the courtroom. Let's go. Oh yes, I forgot to say. I'm afraid he won't be able to make it. Mr. Sholmes, I mean. That's probably for the best. Oh! If he were here, I might be tempted to rely on his help. And that could be seen as weakness. If Lord Van Zykes were to notice, he'd prey on it mercilessly. At least, that's my gut feeling. You're right. Yes, you're so right. Oh, well said, Lockham student Mr. Naruhodo Esquire. Well said. I swear on this sword at my side and on the spirit of Kazuma that it harbors. I'll show him what a Japanese lawyer can do. I'll set you free with honor. Oh, yes. Do they not have anyone else in London? Like maybe because it was so, it was so like last minute. Cause right, weren't they called like two days ago <laughs> for the same guy? But now they're like, well, he's coming back. Might as well use the same people. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session. 
I now call upon the counsels for the prosecution and defense to declare their willingness to proceed. The prosecution is ready. The defense is ready, my lord. Readiness for the trial, my learned Nipponese friend, is not what the defense needs. What you need is readiness for your inevitable defeat. It's not just in my imagination, it's really there. Lord Van Zeiss has such an animosity towards us Japanese for some reason. It was some time ago now that he first became known as the Reaper of the Bailey, I believe. The past few years, he hasn't appeared in court at all. Yet now he's back in the courtroom, though for some reason, only when I'm defending. This Reaper, with his curious disdain for us Japanese, is a prosecutor shrouded in mystery. Still, this isn't the time to be pondering that. I have to concentrate on Soseki's trial. Furthermore, I now call upon the six ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You have been chosen at random to represent the will of the people in this trial. Are you ready to fulfill your duty? Absolutely. I had a feeling this larrikin wasn't innocent before. I must say that I feel especially ruthless on days when my hat refuses to sit right. Oh, well, I, I, I rather like how you're wearing your hat. I think the ruthless look is very fetching, actually. I need to be somewhere at 10 o'clock. I have a, fair, a very important meeting. Let's make this quick. I couldn't agree more. I need to take home five bob tonight or the missus will go through the roof. Oh, may the Lord show us all the light here and lead his flock to a righteous verdict. The British jury system is so very different to our own, isn't it? It's quite extraordinary to think that the power of judgment is in the hand of, hands of six members of the public, and that the judge can only pass sentence when all jurors are in agreement about the, defense, the defendant's guilt. Six citizens of London, chosen at random. Or at least, that's the idea. The prosecution would draw attention to the fact that the accused was on trial here but two, two days ago. Accordingly, where possible, the same jurors have been asked to return for duty today. Very well, let us commence the trial. Lord Van Zykes, your opening statement, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is not the intent of the prosecution to cast doubt over your past decision. However, the innocent verdict afforded to this eccentric Nipponese before has had dire consequences. Did the accused repent for his wrongdoing in that affair? Far from it. But he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I guess he ran. That's about... I mean, he did run when someone was like... <laughs> like, fainted in front of him. That's like about it. It's like the Seinfeld situation. Like, why, you, why they went to jail for not helping that guy. Instead, he used his freedom to perpetrate a most blood-curdling crime. Namely, that of the attempted murder of his neighboring lodger, an innocent Englishman. To explain the circumstances of the crime, the prosecution calls its first witnesses to the stand. The detective responsible for investigating the scene, and the accused himself. Witnesses, your names and occupations, please. Yes, sir. Tobias Gregson, Detective Inspector at Scotland Yard's Homicide Division. Ah, Soseki Natsume from the Empire of Japan. My government ordered me to come here as a student to study your language and culture. Mr. Natsume. Yes, my lord, sir. I'm quite sure I'm not mistaken that you swore an oath never to set foot in my courtroom again. I remember it as if it were yesterday. The day before, in fact, my lord, but close enough. Oh, believe me, this is the last place I want to be. Inspector, let's hear from you first. Explain the case for the court. Right you are, sir. The incident occurred at the Garadev household where the defendant has lodgings. In the ground floor room of the in the ground ground floor room of the victim, Mr. William Shamspear, the defendant has already admitted to visiting the victim on the night in question. 
Mr. Sham Spear collapsed in his room as a result of poisoning by Strich 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 Nine Strich Nine Strich Nine Strich Nine Strich Nine <laughs> I don't know. He was found the following morning when the landlord, suspecting something was wrong, broke down the door. This means, I presume, that the door to the victim's room was locked at the time of the incident? Correct, my lord. It was locked from the inside, making entry to or exit from the room impossible. Although the victim, Mr. Shamspear, lives to tell the tale, he very nearly didn't. The man was halfway to heaven when we first found him. Hmm. I was the first officer on the scene, my lord. And I have a photographic print here that I took at the time to show how it looked. Yes, a chilling scene indeed. The man looks very much deceased. That's right, everyone present believed that's exactly what he was. Very well, I shall accept this photographic print as evidence for the court. Now then, Mr. Natsume. Uh, yes? Yes? As the defendant, do you have anything to say at this juncture? They're... They're haunted. Haunted by evil spirits. Good gracious, what's haunted? My lodgings! There's been a whole series of strange happenings in my lodgings. The tenant before me died in mysterious circumstances. A woman was stabbed by no one on the street outside. My neighbor was poisoned. And me! What about me? I've nearly been killed countless times. Killed, Mr. Natsume? How? Even on that fateful night, it happened. When I returned from Mr. Shamspear's room, I lit my gas stove and climbed into bed, but before long, the stove went out, and somebody tried to kill me! You must always extinguish all fires before retiring from the night, uh, Mr. Natsume. But it's so cold, my, my runny nose would freeze. The point is, I... I didn't poison my neighbor. Oh, why am I being accused of this? Why is my existence so cursed? Thank you, witnesses. I believe I have a reasonably clear picture of events. If I could raise one more point, my lord. One more conclusive point. Conclusive? Go on. Fortunately, the victim, Mr. Shamspear, has regained consciousness after his ordeal, and he has named the true culprit. The poison consumed by the victim was administered in a cup of tea that he drank on the night in question. Tea, my lord, that was brought to the victim's room by the accused. The accused? Good grief! Or dar. Yes, that's the crux of this whole case. If Sosaki is innocent, then why? Why has the victim accused him? Well, Mr. Natsume, what have you to say to this accusation? That evening, yes, I did take some freshly brewed tea with me when I visited Mr. Sham Spears' room as a gift. The public water pump outside always freezes at night, so I bought bottled water especially to make it. And this is the result! Never will I touch tea again! Never! The public pump was frozen, you say? That's not information we've heard before. That will do. Thank you. Now, according to our laws, the defense must have the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses at least once. Therefore, I call upon these witnesses now for a formal testimony. I presume the prosecution has no objection? None whatsoever, my lord. Good. Then you will give your account of events on the night in question to the court now. Yes, my lord. It was around 9 o'clock that evening when I visited my neighbor and I took some tea with me as a gift. We had a heated literary debate over a nice hot drink, after which I went back to my room at around 11. Ah, oh, my tea was completely harmless. He couldn't have locked the door behind me otherwise, could he? Strike. Strike. Oh no. Strike. Strike 9. Strike. Strict mean. <laughs> Oh no, 
I might have to Google how this is pronounced. It takes some time to have an effect on the body. People don't keel over immediately after taking it. The victim would have been perfectly able to lock the door after his guest left. The argument still stands. Hmm, yes I see. It all seems relatively straightforward. Excuse me, but that testimony does raise one rather crucial point, I think. Mr. Natsume claims his tea to have been harmless, presumably though. The teacups have been examined for traces of, traces of poison, haven't they? Why didn't I think of that? Well, as it happens, no, we haven't been able to. Did I hear you correctly, Inspector? Scotland Yard has failed to examine the suspect, suspect substance? How could you have overlooked something so important? Isn't that the first thing you should have done? My learned Nipponi's friend is falsely incensed. The inspector said Scotland Yard was unable to examine the tea, not that it was overlooked. Unable? Why? It's simple enough. There was none left. Not a drop. Someone must have been very thirsty indeed. With current scientific techniques, it's not possible to test for poison under such circumstances. We only need a drop, but that one drop does actually have to exist, funnily enough. The lack of examination notwithstanding, it appears nothing other than the tea passed the victim's lips on the night in question. I see. Thank you. The matter is clear. Cast your eyes over the jury, my learned friend. What? You can see it in their faces, I'm sure. Their recognition of the accused's guilt. Your client's fate is all but sealed. In mere moments from now, you will lose, and your compatriot will be damned for all eternity. He's right. I can feel all six of the jurors looking daggers at me. But I can't let them beat me down. Counsel for the defense, proceed with your cross-examination. Yes, my lord. It was around nine o'clock. Okay. I guess maybe we should ask for more information on what kind of poison is what this? How long does it take for symptoms to appear then? According to the coroner I was speaking to at the yard, about 30 minutes after the poison is consumed, then the victim suffers violent convulsions, cramping, and stiffness, and eventually dies from asphyxi asphyxiation. So there's a 30 minute interval between when the poison is ingested and the onset of, onset of symptoms. There seems, there seem to be a whole lot of different types of poison in the world, that's for sure. Oh dear, death by poisoning again. It's always so awful. 30 minutes is a long time. Certainly long enough for the victim to have locked the door behind the accused after he left. You can't deny that, and it further degrades, uh, yeah, degrades Soseki's alibi. I have the medical report from the doctor who examined the victim here, my lord. It spells it out, really. The accused is the only person who could have done it. Very well, the court will add this report to the court record as evidence. Oh yes, I see it here. Delayed onset, onset of symptoms. Great. Okay, let me see the... Uh, ingest... Ingestion of a small quantity of... Poison. <laughs> Toxic effects present 30 minutes. High likelihood of some been mixed with the tea. No sample. Uh, the poisoning occurred around 1.30? Assessed by the pocket watch. Okay, when that broke. The victim would have been perfectly able to lock the door? Oh wait, he said 11, right? He said 11? He said he left at 11. Okay, he left at 11, so that would mean he would have to like, faint and or die at like, 
At 11? And then this says, this says that he... That the symptoms occurred at 1.30. The poisoning occurred at 1.30? Mr. Natsume, you say it was 11 p.m. when you left to return to your room, correct? Yes! And Inspector Gregson, can we rely on the information in the medical report unconditionally? Of course we can. There's no problem with that report, sunshine. Actually, I think there's a very big problem. Because there, there's a chronological inconsistency between it and the defense, defendant's testimony. A chrono- What? What are you on about? According to this report, the victim must have consumed the poison at around 1.30 in the morning. And yet, the defendant, Mr. Natsume, left the victim's room at 11. Oh. Yes, that's right. There's more than two hours of missing time there. In other words, if there was poison in the tea that Mr. Natsume brought to the victim's room, how could the victim have fallen ill to it two and a half hours after the defendant left? <laughs> They're both surprised, like, oh my god. The defense's argument is entirely reasonable. How do you respond, Lord Van Zykes? Pray forgive the discourtesy if my mind has wandered. I was considering what cuisine would be best to complement the contents of my hallowed chalice this luncheon. How could it how could it have happened, you ask? I do hate to shatter illusions, but my Nipponi's friend appears to be chasing a phantom idea. A phantom? Is it so hard to imagine that the victim drank his tea after the accused had left? For example, at the time stated in the medical report, yes, at around half past one. But he brought the tea at like nine, right? He brought the tea to drink at nine. Like, why would you wait to drink tea at like <laughs> 1 30? It would be like, it'd be freaking cold, wouldn't it? You know, Mr. Natsume brought the tea with him to drink together with his neighbor. And in Japan, there's a well-known saying, Drink tea while it's hot. <laughs> and in my country, there's an even more apt saying. There is nothing more refreshing than cold tea. The, the point is, if there was such a long gap, there may have been other ways to explain how the victim came to be poisoned. Other possibilities. What sort of possibilities, Council? Well, for example, the man could have had another visitor. Another visitor? That's a very bold assertion, my learned friend. From someone who has, had, who has nothing to substantiate it. Or... Or the victim could have taken the poison of his own volition. You suggest this may have been a suicide, Council? <laughs> Mr. Shamspear has categorically denied suicide. The idea can and must be discounted. But, but he could be lying! Is something wrong, Lord Van Zykes? I was listening to the sound of that carriage pulling up outside the courtroom. Pray forgive the discourtesy. Carriage? What carriage? It would seem that the key player in this case has just arrived. Out! Out, brief candle! Life's but a walking shadow! A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Who, sir, are you? 
William Sham Spear, my lord. Alas, twas I, undone by these bitter events. I am the victim. What? What's he doing here? The prosecution seeks to call this gentleman to the stand. With his testimony, my learned friend's futile resistance will be utterly crushed. You're calling him as a witness? Very well, counsel. I grant your request with interest. I'm curious to discover what the court shall hear from the victim himself. Happy I am. Sham spear to regale thee with my tale of woe, my lord. But I still have my own tale to tell, my own tale of worse woe. I can regale the court with the tale of my perfect innocence in perfect English. That will do, Mr. Natsume. Let the court now hear from the victim. Okay, so that's Mr. Sham Spear, but who the heck is that? Yes, I think... I feel sure that we've caught a glimpse of that man before. State your names and occupations for the court, please, witnesses. A writer of words so sweet they do scent the breeze, an inventor of ideas so profound they compose the earth, the unrivaled poet, the unmatched scribe, William Shakespeare, were the great bard to recall to... Wait, were the great bard to be recalled to life anew? Lo, what a magnificent man. Good fellows, I am he who ponders such a miracle. William Sham Spear. Oh, um, the name's Meter Man. Adrian B. Meter Man. I work for the Altamont Gas Company, East End Branch Office. Oh, I remember now. It was yesterday on Briar Road. Oh yeah, she's right, it's him. Well, he was acting kind of suspicious, though. What's that man doing over there? Excuse me. Yes, we spotted him outside Mr. Garadup's house that morning. And he's a gas company employee? What does that have to do with this? So, Mr. William Shamspear, you are the victim in this miserable affair, correct? Oh, heaven, oh, hell, do you command me to remember that sweet poison that didst cross me and cross mine innocent lips? I subpoenaed him before the trial, with his doctor's permission, naturally. Hearing the testimony of the agreed will remove any room for doubt from the jurors' minds, I'm sure. Behold, you have only to rearrange the letters of my name to see that me's a seraph, an angel indeed. Thus be I noble of mind, sweet of nature, and verily honest of heart, as all heavenly angels be. Because there isn't a less contrived meaning in your name. No, not at all. The jurors seem to be very moved by this man, I'm afraid. They're actually taking his Seraph an anagram ideas seriously? Thank you, witnesses, for your illuminating introductions. But my lord, what's the man next to Mr. Shamspear doing here? The gas man, I mean. Uh, what? Me? Well, now. Allow me to enlighten my learned friend. You recall, I presume, your earlier impertinence? When you suggested that the victim had another visitor to his room on the night in question? And moreover, that the victim is a compulsive liar? What? No, no, I didn't quite say that. This young chin stroker here is con- Is to- Is here to con- Controvert your wild claims conclusively. Is that not so, Mr. Meter Man? Eh? Hang on. No. I'm just here- I hereby call for your formal testimonies. You will tell the court as lucidly as possible what happened on the night in question. One may smile and smile and be a villain, 
Yes, it doth pain me. Well, let the truth be spoken. The truth of that wintry night of my discontent. Hmm. The snow lay about. My neighbor did cometh in the evening, bearing a gift of tea. But Mary, bitter was his drink, and when he left, I did fall prostrate on my table. Twas the tea alone did pass my lips that late hour, not else. I was outside this bloke's window in the freezing cold all night, keeping an eye on his room. No one else visited his room but that short little round-backed eastern fella. Wait, what did you say? You were keeping an eye on Mr. Shamspear's room all night? That's right. Of course, the bloke's window was all but blocked up, isn't it? But there's a little gap in the bricks where you can see into the room. So I spent the night trying to keep my teeth from chattering as I peered through that. The question is, sir, why? Huh? Well, now that's because he's on my list. What a piece of work is a man. Wherefore wouldst thou not stare in wonderment? Okay, what are you talking about? This buzzing busybody hath not part in this play. I pray thee, pay him no heed. Make no more ado about his tedious words. What'd you say about me? Calm yourself. This court is concerned with what happened on the night in question. Nothing more. Indeed, that is so. And, as the testimony we have just heard clearly reveals, there was no one other than the accused present at the time who could have carried out this crime. Well, I believe this may be the final testimony of the trial. Now, counsel, the defense may proceed with the cross-examination. Yes, my lord. Okay. I mean, there's not that much. There's only four statements. I might as well just press them all. To be clear, by neighbor, you are referring to the defendant, Mr. Natsume? Oh, indeed, sire. Perchance thou wouldst call that I call him the man from upstairs? And at what time did the mustachioed Nipponese visit you in your room? Our meeting was promised for the hour of nine, and lo, did he come to tender a gift of fragrant tea. Details which are in accordance with the defendant's own testimony, yes. And we were broiled in such a literary debate as history hath not seen before. By which I presume he means their discussion about who was the stronger, Romeo or Juliet. I, Shamspear, did play the part of young Romeo, whilst my neighbor played the fair Juliet. Each of us dressed as we would our characters be, to bring weight upon our merry experiment. I dare not imagine the scene. Frailty, thy name is woman. <laughs> Canst thou imagine how dismayed I was? Yes, I had heard from the, I had heard of the Eastern art of jujitsu, but ne'er did I dream twould be a skill practiced by the com comely maiden. Comely maiden, Juliet B. Romeo up. This is not helping our case. I believe the court has heard enough about your earth-shattering literary debate. Perhaps you could reiterate your statement about the tea that the accused brought to your room. My liege, I am thy servant. Gladly, I would do thy bidding. Mata! Let me stop you there. Mr. Dasume left your room at 11 o'clock, but it wasn't until after 2 that the poison made you collapse. That amounts to more than 3 hours of missing time. If the defendant had really put the poison in your tea, that three-hour window of time is something you're going to have to explain. Gladly, tis an easy task. What? I did drink of the tea, not while my guest did dis tarry, but after he took leave of me. Faith, twas stone cold, but at one hour post midnight, verily were my lips parched. <laughs> that doesn't sound normal. Nay, tis quite ordinary, sire, after all. Thou wouldst recall our fiery debate. Amidst such argument, there'd be no time for fiery tea. Romeo and Juliet again? And who was stronger? 
Mr. Shamspear, in summary, allow me to confirm. Did you not come here with the intention of naming your attacker? But of course, my liege. Twas the stooped lover of words did attempt to shuffle me off this mortal coil. Oh, we all know what that means. So, you didn't have any kind of evening meal, dinner, supper? Ha! <laughs> fie on luxury, fie on gluttony. To eat thrice daily is but a waste of time. Sorry? I would... I would that my belly would were full no more often than the sun doth rise. Well, most heroic eating hab habits, I must say. Night and day do I fill my hours with learned study of the great bard and playwright. Hence is it that is is it that there doth not in my chamber be then the costumes of my art? That would appear to be the case, as even a rodent was found starved to death in your room. Now I think of it, it's not just food that was conspicuously missing from that room, is it? I don't recall seeing a single play or script anywhere. For I have devoured them all. You've eaten them? Every word be within my skull. Didst thou imagine otherwise? Right. That wasn't misleading at all. Now, could you turn around, do you think? Which brings us to the conclusion that the only way the poison could have passed the victim's lips is in the tea. Oh, there was more than four, okay. It seems kind of short, though. But the windows of that house have all been filled in. A historical artifact from of the now defunct window tax. Yeah, you're right there. All bricked up horribly. But as it happens, there's a little part of the brickwork that the bottom corner or at the bottom corner that's been opened up. I was looking in through that gap. Yes, there were a few bricks loose, weren't there? And for some strange reason, a couple bars of soap lined up on the ledge outside as well. I don't like going around poking my chin in other people's business, especially on freezing cold nights. But them's my orders, so that's what I'll keep doing, as long as there's breath in my body. What's with all the theatricals today? Out of interest, Mr. Meter Man. After the accused had left and returned to his own lodgings, did you see the victim leave the room at all? No, he never left. He was in that room the whole time, as far as I'm concerned. And we can therefore discount the possibility of suicide. How can you be sure of that? Police carried out a thorough investigation of the scene and found one receptacle. No, oh, no receptacle for the poison. And since we know the victim didn't leave his room and hence didn't dispose of the poison's container, it's clear that this was no attempted suicide. Only the culprit could have removed the receptacle. Ah, yes. Lucidly explained, counsel. Thank you. It really was. You can't argue with the logic. You say, short little round-backed eastern fella, so you can't be sure it was the defendant, then. How many other shortly little round-backed knee-ponies with a mustache do you think there are in London? Well, of course it's only a narrow gap and it was quite dark, so I didn't notice the mustache. But he showed up at around 9, so I'm pretty sure of myself. And when the person you saw arrived, did he and Mr. Shamspear drink tea together? Nah, sorry, I couldn't say. Why not? Because I couldn't see into the room that well, all, all that well, could I? But what I did see was the silhouette of that little round-backed fellow wearing a pretty dress. Then the pair of them started some kind of wrestling match. I tell you, I didn't know what to make of it. I suppose... That was the Romeo and Juliet championship battle getting underway. Mr. Meter Man, allow me to confirm one final time. Apart from the accused, can you state with certainty that no one else visited the victim on the night in question? No question. Gas Man's honor.
My lord! Goodness me, yes, Mr. Foreman. I've kept my mouth shut and listened up to now, but this has gone on long enough. Are you all with me? Yes. Are we to understand that you ladies and gentlemen of the jury are in agreement with one another? That you've reached a unanimous decision? Too right we have. Are you all with me? Yes. Wait, no, the defense is in the middle of a cross-examination. To be honest, I was holding out a bit of hope for you, young man, especially after you identified those few hours that followed the accused leaving the victim's room. Yes, the three missing hours, as you put it. But in the end, what difference do they make? None. <laughs> None, as far as I can see. And since that's now apparent, there's really no reason to delay our decision any longer. Like I was saying before, if I don't take five bob home with me tonight, the missus will blow her top. Hmm? What's that? Sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said. Very well. Let the court, uh, be appraised of your decisions. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will state your leanings as to the defendant's culpability. Yuzai! 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 All of you? Well, it would appear that the jury is indeed unanimous. So, this time at, at least, it, was, it would seem justice will be done. All's well that ends well, as they say. This calls for a toast, I feel. To the guilty being punished. Get up, please. The trial isn't over. Oh, what do you mean, Miss Usato? What about the information I found in the Encyclopedia of British Law? That obscure right that belongs to the defense in these situations. Remember? A summation examination. Yes, that's right. We don't have a jury in Japanese courts, of course. But here in British Court of Law, we can reverse the decisions of a majority of the jurors. Or if we can, we can force the trial to continue. This trial can't end now. Whatever it takes, I just can't let that happen. The defense moves to invoke its right to a summation examination, my lord. Why am I not surprised at my learned Nipponese friend's inability to admit defeat? You choose to cling desperately to some archaic rule you barely comprehend instead of accepting the truth. Certainly no other defense counselor in recent times has exercised the right to a summation examination. Because they all know that once the jury's mind is set, it cannot be altered. Nevertheless, the right remains and must be upheld. Like, how do they have, like, short-term memory laws? Like, I mean, I get that it's, like, if you didn't play the first one, then it's, like, kind of telling you tutorial. Like, oh, remember, like, remember the summation examination? And then they have to go through the whole thing. Like, oh, it's that thing that defense counsel can use to do this, this, and this. And you're like, oh yeah, okay, we invoke our right. And they're like, oh, he did, did he? Oh, that's never been done before. Like, have you have you not been paying attention to the first fucking game? <laughs> like, didn't we go through this like four times, three, four times already? But whatever. For tutorial's sake, sure. The defense counsel's request is granted. This court will proceed with a summation examination, as outlined in the Encyclopedia of British Law. Thank you, my lord. Are you and your fellows prepared, Mr. Foreman? Believe me, my lord, we know all about this young lad's tenacity. And we're ready for it. Very well. In that case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I hereby call upon each of you to state the grounds upon which you find the defendant guilty of the crime for which he stands accused. Yeah.